Hello, and uh, welcome again to Type Systems. This is the second lecture of the course, and we're going to talk about the Curry the Curry Howard correspondence. Now, we t we talked briefly in the previous lecture about how type systems lead a double life. So, on the one hand, they're a fundamental concept from logic and proof theory, and on the other hand, they're an essential part of modern programming languages, and you may wonder, okay, how exactly does this relationship work? And the idea is that uh, we specify both logic, we can specify both logical systems and uh, and programming language type systems by means of inference rules. And the these these two ideas sort of share a common inheritance. So to understand where formal logic uh, comes from, we have to go back a hundred years. And so at the very early part of the 20th century, mathematics had grown very, very abstract. And as a result, the simple numerical and geometric intuitions that people used to justify their mathematical arguments no longer seemed strong enough to justify the mathematical proofs that uh, mathematicians were inventing. So for instance, when uh, Cantor invented his, uh, did his famous proof about uh, there being different sizes of uh, infinity, uh, other other mathematicians were uh, were very 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 dubious. Like Kronecker infamously said, "This is not mathematics. This is theology," and so people were really worried. What if we mess things up? And in fact, they were they were uh, they were right to be worried because you know many simple ideas seem to have all sorts of paradoxical consequences, and so. The big idea at the turn of the century was, well, if we want to study mathematical theorems and proofs precisely, well, we already have a, a tool for studying things very precisely, and that's mathematics. So why not treat theorems and proofs as ordinary mathematics themselves? And so by proving theorems about the systems that you use to reason, you can gain confidence that they actually work. And this idea had a lot of dramatic successes and failures, but the formal systems they introduced were very unnatural. Proofs did not look like human proofs. So some of the successes were, for instance, Herbert's proof that uh, uh, Euclid's geometry could be completely formalized, and the the uh, most dramatic failure, of course, was Gödel's proof that uh, uh, proof of the second incompleteness theorem that uh, you know not there are arithmetic statements that no system can prove about itself. And so, but like but all of these, all of these stories had the same common feature that the, their model of proof was a bit artificial. These, uh, these formal systems had been invented to make metamathematics easy, uh, easy, and as a result, the proofs that you actually wrote down were, did not look anything at all like what humans wrote down. And to resolve this problem, in 1933, at the age of 23, the German logician Gerhard Gensen invented what he called natural deduction. And he called it natural deduction because the idea was that the structure of his proofs was natural and sort of mimics uh, uh, ordinary mathematical English if you squint a little bit. Um, and so his idea was the following. He said, okay, first, let's just ask, what are the propositions? And for this lecture, we're just going to stick with propositional logic, even though uh, Gensen actually looked at full first order logic. And he said, okay, well, what are the propositions of propositional logic? He said, well, true is a proposition. And if P and Q are propositions, well, then the proposition P and Q is also a proposition. False is a proposition. Um, and if P and Q are propositions, then the proposition P or Q is also a proposition. And if P and Q are propositions, then P implies Q is a proposition. And so these give the these generate the formulas of propositional logic. And so as I said before, there's no quantifiers here, but there's a still enough to fill up a whole lecture. And so, so how do proofs in basic propositional logic work? Because, you know, some claims are true, some claims are false. So if I told you P and Q implies Q and P, well, then you're going to believe me. But if I told you uh, something else, like say true implies false, 
then you aren't going to be uh, believe me. And so we need some way of deciding, to some way of judging which propositions hold and which ones don't. And the way we do so is with judgments. And so we're going to give a judgment P true to mean that here is a way of judging P to be true. And so how do we form these judgments? And the answer is with inference rules. And this is where we're going to start seeing that connection to type theory. So if we want to talk about how to prove something that prove the true proposition, well, it's always true. We don't need any premises. If we see the proposition true, then we can judge it to be true immediately. And if we want to judge P and Q to be true, well, then first we have to judge P to be true. And then second, we have to judge Q to be true. And if both of those hold, we can, we're licensed to conclude that P and Q is true. And if somehow we have judged P and Q to be true, we can use it. We can say, well, I know P and Q is true, so therefore I'm going to conclude that I'm going to judge P to be true. And symmetrically, if we have found out that if we've judged P and Q to be true, then we can judge Q to be true. And here on the on the right, I've put these little uh, these little names like and introduction. So it's called an introduction rule because it tells us how to f how to justify introducing a conjunction. And this this is called a and and e one and and e two are the two elimination rules. So if we've gotten the judgment that p and q is true, we can use this rule to eliminate the uh, the conjunction and make it draw some draw a conclusion from it and in the on the left we take p and q when it's judged to be true to to justify that p that p is true and symmetrically we can justify from p and q being true that q is true okay so this was pretty straightforward um let's let's look at a, another logical connective say implication and so when you're writing a mathematical proof, what you do when you see, when you need to prove P implies Q, what you do is you say, well, the first thing you write at the top of the page is, well, assume P. And then you go on to prove Q. And if you can prove Q under the assumption of P, then you have a proof of P implies Q. But we made an assumption. And so if we have some assumptions, like the, the set of assumptions we're making can change as we go through the proof. And so therefore, our notion of judgment needs to keep track of what assumptions we've made as well. And so what we're going to do is we're going to introduce a new judgment form, psi turnstile p is true, which means that under the assumptions in psi, we're going to judge P to be true. And Psi is just a list of the assumptions that we've made so far. And so if we want, if we, so the way that we can use a hypothesis is pretty simple. So if we've assumed that P is true, then obviously we can prove that, it, that it's true by just using that assumption. And the way that we prove implications is just as I said before, to under Psi, to judge that P implies Q is true, we judge that Q is true under the, uh, under, with the additional assumption that P is true. So if we prove from Psi and P that Q is true, we can conclude from, uh, that under the assumption Psi, P implies Q is true. And the way that we use an implication, so this, uh, this is how we introduce an implication, and the way that we use an implication is we say, well, if we have judged P implies Q to be true, and we have also judged that P is true, then we can judge that Q is true. Because P implies Q says, if you know P, then Q, and over here we've proved that P, so therefore Q holds. Okay, and with assumptions in hand, it actually becomes possible to do things with disjunction as well. So introducing disjunctions is pretty easy. So if you've, if you've proven P, then you've also proven P or Q. And conversely, if you've proven Q, you've also proven that P or Q is true. So in order to prove P or Q, introduce P or Q, we just have to uh, show that one of the disjuncts is, uh, is provable. But if you have a P or Q, 
if someone if someone gives you a proof that P or Q has been judged to be true, then you don't necessarily know which one of it which one of those two it is. And so if you want to use this assumption, what you've got to do is you've got to do true two proofs. You if you can prove that R is true under the assumption of P, and you can prove that R is true under the assumption of Q, then you're licensed to conclude that R is true. Because, after all, you proved that P or Q is true, and you proved that assuming P R holds and assuming Q R holds. So therefore, whichever, whichever one of P or Q it is, we'll always be able to prove that R is true. The interesting one is false. Or another interesting one is false, I should say. So the way that a false works is that there's no way introduction form for it. After all, we don't believe you can ever judge false to be true um, directly. And if you do, if you have well, somehow under your used your assumptions to show that false is true, well, you're in an inconsistent context. You've made an inconsistent set of assumptions, and under an inconsistent set of assumptions, you can judge anything you like. So this is uh, the the famous uh, the famous saying ex falso quad libit or from falsehood everything follows and if you want to say things even more excitingly it's sometimes called the principle of explosion so if you have a proof of false you can get anything in the world now here's an example of a uh, of a natural deduction proof and you're going to see what i why i said earlier that you have to squint a bit in order to see that the uh, proofs in natural deduction mimic the st natural style of reasoning. So if we wanted to prove that P or Q implies R, implies both P implies R and Q implies R, well, the way we can do it is as follows. Well, so the central connective is an implication. We want to prove that this implication implies that pair of uh, two smaller implications. And so the way we introduce an implication is by making an assumption. So now we've assumed that if you have P or Q, then you can get R. And under that assumption, we want to show that both P implies R holds and Q implies R holds. And so, well, if you want to prove both of those, we can use the AND introduction rule. So one of these will be to prove that P implies R, and another one will be to show that Q implies R. In this diagram, I'm only going to show P implies R because the other half looks very similar. So, okay, so how do you prove P implies R? Well, you use implication introduction. You make the assumption that P holds, and now we want to prove that R holds. How can we do that? Well, the only thing we have in our context is an implication that produces R. And in order, in order to use this implication, we're going to have to prove that uh, P implies Q or R holds. And so we can get that as a, uh, uh, from our assumption, and now we can try to prove that, that, the, uh, uh, that the hypothesis of the, uh, of the implication holds. So in order to use this, this uh, implication, what we need to do is we need to show that either P or Q holds. But look over here we've got P as a hypothesis. And so we can use one of the OR introduction rules that says, okay, well, it'll suffice to prove P, and that's precisely what we have in our, uh, in our uh, list of assumptions. And the Q implies R case is exactly the same, except that we're going to change all those P's to Q's. Okay, and so with those two branches, we'll be able to show that P or Q implies R itself implies both P implies R and Q implies R. Now, let's switch gears and look at the typed lambda calculus. So, what I mean by the typed lambda calculus is, you know, the very kernel of a small functional programming language like OCaml or SML or something like that. And so we're going to have some really baby data structures in it. So we're going to say, well, you have unit and you have pairs. And I'm also going to give you zero, which is an empty type, as well as x plus y, which is going to be a tagged union. And of course, I'm going to give you functions so that your functional language has functions.
So X arrow Y is the type of functions that take arguments of type X and return values of type Y. And so for units, we have a simple, a simple nullary pair for it. And for binary pairs, well, we have a, we can introduce it with a binary pair and we have first and second to take their projections. And for the tagged unions, X plus Y, we can embed it either into the left branch or the right branch. And then we have a little p pattern matching example uh, construct, which says case analyze your, uh, uh, your expression E. And if it's left of something, execute E prime. And if it's right of something, execute E double prime. And then we have lambda X uh, colon big X dot E for function introduction and E applied to E prime for the uh, function application. And just like we saw in the first lecture, we're going to have a context of variables. And now we're going to introduce a judgment form that says uh, a term E has the type X under the context gamma. And the way we're going to specify this typing judgment is by giving a set of typing rules. So the way we form a unit is very easy. If you have a literal unit expression, it has the type unit. And if you have two expressions, E, which has the type X, and E prime, which has the type Y, then you can put the two together in a pair, E comma E prime, to form something that has the product type X times Y. And if you have something of product, of product type X times Y, you can take the first component to get the X, and you can take the second component to get the Y. Okay, fine. And if you want to implement functions, what you can do, and variables, what you can do is you can say, well, if you have a variable little x of type big X in your context, then you can use it. So a variable reference little x has the type big X because we just look it up in the context and it tells us what type the variable has. And to introduce a function, lambda x colon e, what we'll do is we'll assume that little x is a variable that has the type big X and show that the function body E has the type Y. Then the lambda expression lambda X dot E will be a function from X to Y. And if you have a function from X to Y and you have an argument E prime, which is of type X, you can apply the two to get a Y. Okay. And now let's look a little bit at data structures. So these are like some types in uh, OCaml. So if you have an expression E of type X, you can tag it with the, with the constructor L to get something of type X plus Y. And you, if E has the type Y, then you can tag it with the right uh, cons data constructor R to get something of the type X plus Y. And if you have this piece of tagged data, what you're allowed to do is you can say, well, if I have something of the type X plus Y, I can check the two branches of this case statement. In the first branch, labeled E prime, we're going to bind the 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 uh, we're going to do a pattern batch, and we're going to bind the body, the 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 tagged the value that was under the tag to the variable x, and then we're going to show that E prime has the type z, and if it was a uh, a value of type y that was tagged by a big R then we can assume we have a variable little y of type big Y and check that E double prime has the type Z. And so you should think, evaluate E until it's either a, a left of something or a right of something and then pick which branch to execute. And then finally, we have an empty type. And so if you have an empty type, you're obviously not going to have any way of introducing it. And if somehow you had something of an empty type, well, you know that you're in dead code. And so you can say, well, I'm just going to call an abort and I'm going to give it any type you like because I know that actual exe runtime execution will never reach here. Okay, and so this whole thing has been deliberately set up to uh, look a lot like what you've just seen before. And so here, let's, let's keep pushing this a little bit. Here is a function and it takes a function as an argument of type x plus y to z, and then it builds a pair, a pair of functions. And it's going to have the type x plus y to z to x to z times y to z. So we get our function f, and then the first component of the pair take, applies that function f 
to left of its argument, and the second function in that pair applies f to right of its argument, and so you get the x to z and the y to z that way. But you might just notice a similarity here. If we ch change these pluses to v's, and these times to wedges, and these arrows to implications, we're going to get a perfect match with propositional logic. And so the Curry-Howard correspondence can be explained as saying, well, each construct in logic has a corresponding construction in functional programming. So a formula of logic is a type of a programming language. A proof of a formula is a program of a certain type in, in a functional programming language. The proposition of truth corresponds to the unit type. The proposition of falsehood corresponds to the empty type. Uh, logical conjunction corresponds to pairing in a programming language, that is forming records, multiple, multiple pieces of data together. And if you have logical disjunction, that corresponds to having a tagged union in a programming language. And finally, implication in logic corresponds to functions. And so this looks really dramatic because, you know, natural deduction was invented in 1933 by a German logician who had absolutely no, no conception of what a computer was. Like, when you, when you, if you said computer to him, he would imagine a human being who received, some, uh, who received a letter in the mail saying, do this computation for me, and then he or she would work out the calculation and then mail it back to you. That's what a computer was to Gerhard Genson. And somehow, by like some magic, this, uh, this, uh, um, there's this perfect matchup between this concept in logic and this concept in programming. But there's something that programs do that we don't normally think of logical formulas and proofs doing. Programming languages have semantics. You don't just write a program in order to show that a certain type is inhabited. What you do is you write a program to run it. And, you know, a programming language runs. And is there any, 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 and it's abnormal, or at least unexpected, to think of evaluating a proof. But this correspondence is so perfect that we might think, okay, well, let's look at language semantics and see if this gives us ideas about logic. Okay, but to do that, we first have to talk about what the semantics of the typed lambda calculus is. So here, what we're going to do is we're going to say, let's build an operational semantics for this language. It's going to be a reduction relation, which tells you how to evaluate this functional program. And so we're going to say the values of the functional programming language are, are units, pairs of values, lambda expressions, which are the function values, and tagged values, which are the values of some type. So this is a subgrammar of the language of all programs, but these are the things that we want to evaluate programs to compute. And so we're going to do that by giving a transition relation, which says E steps to E prime. And the way that we're going to spe specify this transition relation is very similar to the way that we uh, did in the previous lecture. So we're going to give a series of rules. Some of these rules will be bookkeeping congruence rules. So on the top, we see that if we have e1, the pair e1, e2, it will step to e1 prime e2 if e1 steps to e1 prime. Or reading it top down, we can say e1 steps to e1 prime implies that e1 comma e2 steps to e1 prime comma e2. So the idea here is that when you see a pair, you're going to evaluate the first component first. And if the first component is already a value, then the thing we want to do is we want to evaluate the second component. So if the first component is a value, we'll see if e2 can step to e2 prime. And then in that case, v1 e2 will step to v1 e prime 2. Okay, well, that's sort of evaluating until you get a pair value. But what do you do with a pair value? Well, if you have a pair value, you can take the first component and say, you can say, if I have first of v1 comma v2, then I get v1. 
Or you can say if I take the second component of v1 comma v2, I'm going to get v2. And this tells you how to evaluate a projection when you have a value. But if you don't have a value yet, if you just have first a v, what you'll do is you'll say, well, see how e prime uh, progresses. So if e progresses to e prime, then first a v will progress to first a v prime. And similarly, if e progresses to e prime or e steps to e prime, then second a v will step to second a v prime. And so the idea is we're going to apply these uh, congruence rules until we hit one of these uh, values and then we can actually like do some computation. So, you know, similarly for the, for the sum types, what we're going to do is we're going to give a, a congruence rule for the uh, uh, void type. So e, if e steps to e prime, then abort of e will step to abort of e prime. And if you have a tagged expression, L of e, you'll, you'll move it towards being a value by sending, by seeing if e can go to e prime. And if so, L of e will go to L of e prime. And similarly, R of e will go to R of e prime if e goes to e prime. Okay, so now we can get a tagged value. Well, how do we use it? Well, we use uh, tagged values in a case statement. And if you do case E of something, you have to evaluate E until it becomes a value. So we'll have the rule, if E goes, if e goes to E prime, then case E of left of X goes to E1, right of Y goes to E2, that whole thing will step to case of E prime with the left and the right branches remaining unchanged. And finally, if we are case analyzing a, a sum value, it's either going to be a left or a right. So if we do case of left of v, then what we can do is we can say, well, the e1 branch is the branch that we're going to take. And so we can substitute v for x and then evaluate e1. And if we, if instead the uh, scrutiny of the case statement is a right-hand uh, branch, we can throw away the left-hand branch and step to v for y in e2. So this is like sort of the semantics of pattern matching as you deconstruct the data. And for functions, what we're going to do is we're going to say, well, if we see e1, e2, try to evaluate e1 to e1 prime. And if that works, we send the whole application to e1 prime e2. And if the, the, the head of an application is already a value, you try to evaluate the argument. So if you have v1, e2, then see if e2 goes to e2 prime. And if it does, v1, e2 will go to v1, e prime, e2 prime. And if both of the function and its arguments are values, so if you have lambda x dot e and you apply it to v, then that expression is going to step to v for x in e. So what we're doing is we've given a set of reduction rules for the simply typed lambda calculus and we can prove type safety and it'll be the same pattern as in the last lecture first we prove weakening which says that if e is a well-typed term in a context gamma gamma prime we're allowed to add new variables to it so uh, we can stick z colon big z in the middle of the context and e will still be well typed and if you have y and z in the context and e has the type x, then you can permute those variables and e will still have the type x. So neither weakening or exchange change the change the uh, uh, typeability of a term. And we'll also prove substitution, which says if you have a term e of type x and another term e prime of type y that has a free variable of type x, you can perform the substitution and you'll still have a term of type y. And then with substitution in hand, you'll be able to prove progress and preservation. So you'll say if you have a closed expression, then it's either a value or it can take a step, which means that um, you know a well-typed term is not going to be stuck from the very outset. And secondly, we'll prove preservation, which says if you have a well-typed term and it takes a step, it's still well-typed. And so these two together mean that um, your well-typed term is either a value or it can take a step. And if it does take a step, it's still well-typed, which means, again, you, you're either a value or you can take a step. And so type safety always keeps you within the envelope of safe executions. And the proofs will all be very similar to the previous lecture. But now we can ask, what does evaluation and type safety mean from a logical perspective? And 
The thing to notice is that when I was describing the reduction rules of the simply typed lambda calculus to you, there were two different kinds. One rule, one kind of evaluation rule was what you might call a congruence rule. So on the left hand side, we, uh, we had a whole bunch of rules of the form. If E1 steps to E1 prime, then E1 comma E2 will step to E1 prime comma E2. So what this rule is doing is it's not actually uh, um, doing any computation on the expression e1, e2. It's just, uh, it's just um, evaluating some of the subterms. But on the other hand, on the right hand side, we have a rule like first of v1 comma v2 steps to v1. And here, like sort of some uh, computational work is really happening here. We have this pair and we're going to project out a component and we'll get out a new value. And we've actually like done some computation here. And similarly, another example of a congruence rule are the rules for functions. So here I've written uh, if e2 steps to e2 prime, then v1 e2 will step to v1 e2 prime. So again, the application is not making any progress, but we are evaluating the subterms. And in contrast, if you have lambda x colon e applied to v, then this thing will actually do some computational work. It'll take that value v and it will replace every occurrence of x with it. So your term has really changed what it's uh, what it's doing. And so the reason we have these two, kind, two kinds of rules is that the congruence rules control when evaluation happens. So if you look back here, we have two congruence rules for pairs. And what this says is first evaluate the first component until it's a value, then evaluate the second component into it until it's a value. And so this is enforcing a form of left to right evaluation. And so the all the co uh, congruence rules put together collectively control the evaluation order of the language. And on the other hand, we have the reduction rules, which actually do a serious transformation to a term. So these are the things where actual computation happens, where you get a, a tagged value and you take it apart and you make a branch based on the decision. So this is where like actual computation happens. And now, because we're always thinking about the Curry-Howard correspondence, what we can do is we can go and take a look at the reduction rules. So here's the function reduction case where we have lambda x dot e applied to v, and that steps to v substituted for x in e. Let's take a look at the typing derivation here. So we have at the bottom lambda x colon big x dot e applied to v has the type y. And why does it have that type? Well, because this is an application and the application rule tells us, well, we know that the, that the thing in the function position has the type x arrow y. And because we wrote a lambda, that means we had to use the implication introduction rule. And so that means that we're going to have a term e of type y in a context where little x has the type big x. And similarly, we also need to know that v, uh, that v is a well-typed uh, value. And from the fact that the application is well-typed, we know that the argument has to be well-typed. So we know that v has the type of big x. But the take a, take a look at what just happened. We have an arrow introduction that's immediately followed by an arrow elimination. And if you look at all of the, if you assume you've got well-typed terms and you look at every single one of the reduction rules, you'll say they all have this property of having seeing an intro that's immediately followed by an elimination rule. And so what evaluation does is it removes a detour from your proof rather than saying, okay, we're going to do implication introduction and then apply it to V, we can simplify it by saying, well, this thing is actually the same thing as V for X in E. And so in fact, every single reduction in, the, in our uh, reduction rules has the same character. So when you see first and second, the v1 comma v2 is an introduction. It introduces a pair, and then it's immediately followed by a first. 
which throws away that pair. And when you're doing a case statement, if the head of the uh, of the case statement, the scrutiny, is a left branch, we're going to simplify it by getting rid of that uh, um, or introduction rule and that or elimination rule and just replacing it with v for x and e1. And so similarly for right and similarly for functions. And so you can see every single reduction in the operational semantics corresponds to an introduction rule followed by an elimination rule. And so now let's go back and look at values. So what are values? Values are introduction forms. They are not reducible expressions. And so, and our type safety proof says, well, you can always keep evaluating until you reach a value. So in some sense, programs are trying to evaluate towards a normal form. And the choice of which normal form you get is determined by the evaluation order. So we're going to take all of these detours and cut them out, but if there may be many possible detours inside your program. And so what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to use an introduction rule in order to stage them. And so this means that we can extend the Curry-Howard correspondence. So formulas are types, proofs are programs, logical connectives like truth, falsehood, conjunction, disjunction, implication, correspond to programming language types like units and empty types and pairs and tagged unions and functions. And we can say that values correspond to a normal form of the lambda calculus. And we can say that evaluating a program corresponds to the normalization of proofs in logic. And so the evaluation order corresponds to a normalization strategy. So evaluations remove detours and you have to pick an order to get rid of them. And so if you want to eliminate your normalization, uh, il eliminate uh, detours, you're going to have to pick an order to do it in. And that's either the normalization strategy or the evaluation order. So the Curry-Howard correspondence goes much further than many people expect. But if you go look these things up on the uh, internet, occasionally you'll see people say that the Curry Howard, talk about the Curry Howard isomorphism. And technically, it is not an isomorphism. And the reason for that is that um, the logical derivations and the type theoretic derivations are not in one to one correspondence. So at the top, what we've got is a proof that from the two assumptions p and p, we can prove that p and p is deemed to be true. And so how do you prove a conjunction? Well, you use and introduction, and that says from p and p, we have to prove that p is true. And this is a perfectly fine proof. It is one proof in the, in, in the natural deduction calculus of Gensen, but it corresponds to four for uh, typing derivations in the simply typed lambda calculus. And so you can imagine that you have two variables, x and y, both of type x. And if you have two variables and you want to build something of the type x times x, you actually have four choices. You can build a pair with two x's. You can build a pair with two y's. You can build a pair with an x and a y. Or you can build a pair with a y and an x. And so this, these, all four of these programs are all extremely different uh, from a computational perspective. So if X is the type of integers, then um, we really do have four genuinely different pairs. But on the other hand, up here in logic, there are no names for these, uh, uh, for these, ver for these uh, assumptions. We just have a list of assumptions. We have no variable names. And so when we use an assumption, we don't know a priori whether it was the first P or the second P that we used. And so there's a tight correspondence between uh, the natural deduction calculus and the simply typed lambda calculus, but it's not quite an isomorphism. Um, if you labeled all of these assumptions, then you might be able to turn it into a true isomorphism. but this is uh, this is a uh, um, 
an idea that Genson did not have in 1933. Okay, and uh, thank you all very much for listening, and I will uh, see you again or hear you again at the next lecture.